They say the NFL is a business, and well, there's no denying that. Hundreds of millions of dollars are regularly changing hands, and pretty much everything the league does is in the pursuit of more profits. Hello, I like money. At the organizational level, it's much of the same. Franchises will do everything and anything they can to protect their business, even if that means putting extremely controversial clauses in the contracts of their players. So let's take a look back at 10 of the craziest contract clauses that we've ever seen. It feels like we would be remiss to not start off with the most recent one that absolutely rocked the sports world, the now infamous homework clause in Kyler Murray's massive extension with the Arizona Cardinals. At first, Murray seemed to have finally triumphed in a seemingly endless odyssey of contract disputes. He had been hammering the Cardinals for a big money extension for months, and it looked like a big win for Murray in his camp. I mean, it's not every day that you see a $230.5 million extension getting thrown around, especially not with over $100 million of it being guaranteed. In fact, Murray's one 160 mil guaranteed is more than what Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen got. But it appears that the Cardinals were not without reservations, as they slotted in an independent study addendum which required the young quarterback to complete at least four hours per week of film review on his own. And the kicker was it forbade him from using a second screen while studying. Sounds to me like this may not have been the first time that the two sides have butted heads on this issue. Of course, this started a media firestorm. So my much so that the team ultimately decided to take the addendum out of the contract because it created such a huge distraction. It'll be fascinating to see over time if doing so was a mistake or if Murray will take the hint and start turning into more of a true professional regardless of whether or not his contract mandates it. Doing so will require him to change his tune from a 2021 interview in which he told the New York Times, I'm not one of those guys that's gonna sit there and kill myself watching film. I don't sit there for 23 hours and break down this team and that team and watch every game because, in my head, I see so much. Yeah, it's no wonder Arizona put that clause in. This isn't the first time that we've seen a team try and micromanage its star player's preparation process. Back in the 90s, the Detroit Lions put a clause in Barry Sanders, yes, THE Barry Sanders, contract to try and incentivize him to pump iron with his teammates instead of as a lone wolf. The Lions put a clause in his contract that would pay him 100 grand if he regularly lifted weights at the team facility in the offseason. But apparently, Sanders was happy enough to punt on the cash and do his own thing. Because knowing Sanders' work ethic, it isn't that he was ducking the work. He had a reputation for being one of the hardest workers in the league. More likely, he was just sick of the Lions execs and didn't want to cave to their demands while they failed to build a team around him. Another popular issue that we see addressed in NFL contracts is players' weights, like Eddie Lacy, whose weight incentives were an insanely prevalent talking point when he signed his new deal with the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle designated seven check-in points throughout season to incentivize him to get down from the ballooned 270-some-odd pounds he reportedly was when he visited with the team that offseason. He had to get down to 255 by May, 250 in June and August, then 245 pounds each month once the season started. And with each successful weigh-in, Lacey would see a nice 55,000 boost to his bank account, adding up to 385k in total. Even for Lacey, a man with deep, deep love for China food, complying with this was a no-brainer. There have been a number of different weight clauses over the years, but we've seen a couple of particularly interesting spins on the traditional make weight X, get Y amount of money arrangement, like when the Philadelphia Eagles signed former Ravens wide receiver Mike Wallace to a one-year deal during the 2018 offseason. Wallace had a reputation for being one of the most explosive deep threats in the league. So, as you might imagine, he was in pretty good shape his entire career. Which is why the language in his contract drew so many questions. The Eagles agreed to pay Wallace nearly $600,000 if he weighed under 250 pounds, giving him around 50 pounds of wiggle room from his typical playing weight. People around the league were utterly puzzled until they realized that Philly did this because weight incentives were not calculated into the NFL's compensatory pick formula. Meaning that by setting up the contract this way, Wallace was essentially guaranteed the money he wanted and Philly wouldn't have have to surrender any draft capital to Baltimore for signing him away from them. Honestly, pretty savvy moves coming from the city of brotherly love. I suppose that this isn't the only time that we've seen an NFL team take advantage of the league's bizarrely complex cap structure and rules, either to protect their long-term interests on a risky contract or meet an agent's request for an inflated overall number on the deal. All right, then let's negotiate. We want everything. We'll give you nothing. We want something. Deal. 
Take the deal that the Miami Dolphins inked Brandon Marshall back in 2010. At the time, it was believed that the deal would make Marshall the league's highest paid wide receiver, which had a lot of people in and around the league very puzzled. Not that Marshall was a scrub by any means, but he was getting up there in age, and hey, let's face it. There were more than a handful of guys that you would rather have as your number one option. There were more eyebrow-raising aspects to the contract, like the $2.7 million roster bonus payable in 2014 if Marshall were to practice in 95% of the Dolphins' special teams plays, which let's be honest, would never happen in a million years. Miami also structured the deal so that it only paid Marshall, a guy with a history of off-the-field issues, 5.5 mil up front. As for the rest of the guaranteed money on the deal, it could only be unlocked after year one. And the contract still gave Miami a number of outs. You're out. This is not too dissimilar to what their divisional rival, the New York Jets, did with their struggling quote unquote franchise quarterback, Mark Sanchez, when they re signed him in 2012. When the contract was announced, both parties made it seem like Sanchez was going to receive $20.5 million in guaranteed money over the next two seasons, which isn't entirely untrue, it just omitted the fact that Sanchez was already due to earn $17.75 million over the next two seasons, meaning that for an extra $2.75, the Jets now had three straight option years, meaning they could keep him if he performed, or they could cut him without further investment after the 2013, 14, or 15 seasons. Having this kind of language in the contract gave the deal a reputation around the league for being a lipstick and powder deal. Now, this isn't the only controversial clause that the Jets have been involved in either. In fact, they even had one with Debrick Shaw Ferguson, one of the best players in their lowly franchise's history. His deal was set up similarly to Marshall's in some sense, as it was said to be worth $60 million over six years. But with a closer look, it was clear that the offensive lineman was never going to be able to earn that much money. He, like Marshall, had one of those ridiculous special teams incentives worth $1.3 million that would have required him to play 97% of the team's special snaps and block a ridiculous seven punts. That would have broken the NFL record for blocked punts. It's not entirely contract related, but worth noting that the Jets in their infinite wisdom did him pretty dirty on his career consecutive snap streak. He only missed one snap during his entire career, and it was so that New York could run some ill-fated trick play. Speaking of controlling the narrative, that's exactly what the Cincinnati Bengals Bengals tried to do after signing wide receiver Carl Pickens took a turn for the worse. Since he had signed Pickens to a five-year $23.2 million deal, and a mere three months after he took the $3.5 million in signing bonus, he all but went nuclear trying to blow up the deal. Then during the final week of the season, Pickens criticized Bengals management for not firing Coach Coslett after he posted a 7-24 record over two seasons. Pickens was subsequently released on the first day of training camp the following year. This prompted the Bengals to create what's since been deemed the Carl Pickens Clause, which is controversial language that they began to attach to new players' signing bonuses that prevented them from speaking out publicly against the team by levying financial sanctions. It's somewhere between an NDA and company-led censorship. Tough luck for a franchise to know that they are such a miserable destination for players that they have to contractually prevent players from speaking out against their awful organization. Then, on the other hand, we have the arrangement between the Dallas Cowboys and their former star wide receiver, Des Bryant. News of the controversial clause broke shortly after it was announced that he had signed a five-year deal to stay in Dallas worth 70 mil, with 45 mil of it guaranteed. Now, this was big news at the time because Bryant was one of the best receivers in the league, and he was threatening to sit out the Cowboys season opener if he didn't have a new deal in place by the deadline in July. He had already skipped most of the team's off-season workouts and whatnot too, so I'd say that both sides were pretty ecstatic to actually get something locked in. Word leaked that there were a bevy of strings attached to the deal that Dallas instituted to try to hedge against the risk of Des regressing. Or worse, if he fell back into his old ways and started to find trouble off the field that the infamous Des rules sought to stave off. His contract was in many ways the superstar equivalent of Mark Sanchez's lipstick and powder deal. Dallas worked all sorts of safeguards into the deal that made the $45 million guaranteed, well, not so guaranteed. 
Take his $20 million signing bonus for example. 7 mil was deferred until March 15th the following year. And as far as the remaining 13 mil, half was paid at signing, like you might expect with a signing bonus, while the rest of it was to be paid out with each weekly game check. Meaning that Dallas still had control of the money and subsequently Dez long term, while only paying him an extra 3.2 mil for that year. Last but not least, we have an all-time classic, Rick Meyer and his end of the world clause. When he signed with the Seahawks in 1993 as the number two overall pick in the draft, he and his agent worked in a clause that did, well, exactly what you think, guaranteed his money up to and including the end of the world. And you know what? It's a good thing that they did because Meyer ended up being a huge bust in Seattle. So maybe his controversial move was more strategic than publicity related after all. All practicalities aside, the move drew the ire of NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabu, who came down with a hammer, voiding the contract and accusing Seattle and Myrer of designing a contract to circumnavigate the rookie salary cap negotiated in the new CBA. All in all, this was easily one of the most controversial contracts that the league had ever seen. But which do you think is the most controversial NFL contract clause? Was there any that we missed? Join us in the comments section below. If you liked this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps out a ton. And hey, we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming around to TPS though, subscribing is a great idea because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time.